we're preparing to go live. I would just give it a few more seconds. Okay. Great. It is Wednesday, uh, May 12th, and I'm gonna call this Transportation Policy Board meeting to order. And um, we're gonna start with some introductions. Can you uh, do that, Mark? I will. Um, and I'll just um, call out the jurisdiction and you can introduce yourself. Um, city of Olympia. Uh, Danny Madrone with the City of Olympia. And Tumwater, we have both our primary and our alternate. Pete Komet, who is your primary, my primary representative for Tumwater. And Charlie, go ahead, Demayo, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Charlie Schneider is my backup here. Okay, thank you. Uh, city of Rainier. Uh, George Johnson, City of Rainier. And the great city of Tonino. John O'Callaghan representing the great city of Tonino. Good morning, <laughs> one and all. Sorry, I stole your thunder there. Uh, inner City Transit. Don Melnick, Inner City Transit. And our state government rep. Kevin Dragon with the Department of Enterprise Services. And our community rep and vice chair. Graham Sackerson. Okay, and I see our WashDOT rep is here. Yes, good morning. John Winans is here, and I do have a meeting I'm going to have to go to before this one ends, but Gaius Sonoy is here to cover for Washington. Okay. If he hasn't signed in yet, he's on his way. Oh, okay. All right. And uh, North Thurston Public Schools. Good morning. Deanna Maddox, North Thurston Public Schools. Okay. I don't think I see any others that stuck in while I was talking. So um, for staff from TRPC, I'm Mark Daly. I'm the director. Um, we have Bina Tabit, our Deputy Director, Karen Parkhurst, Dave Reed, Berlina Lucas, Allison Osterberg, Michael Ann Brogy, and Paul Brewster. And well, and I'm that. not dead yet. Business Representative Doug DeForest. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. I came so close to getting it all done correctly. <laughs> Sorry about that, Doug. That's um, all right. And from Thurston County, we have Matt Unzelman. From Tumwater, we have Mary Heather Ames. From Olympia, we have Sophie Stimson. And from Inner City Transit, we have Rob Lafontaine. If I have missed anyone else, that's please. Oh, and I see that Guy Sonoy from WashDOT is signing in right now. I think we're going to chair. And I guess I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Andy Ryder, Mayor of Lacey, and the Chair of the Transportation Policy Board. <laughs> 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 with, with that, do you have some announcements? Mark? I do. We've got a, a, a lot going on right now. Um, as many of the jurisdictions are, are working on um, various requests from our congressional delegation, we are as well. We're putting together right, an um, a application for Senator Murray's office. Um, folks may have, have noticed that we received $5 million from the state legislature for our I-5 work. Um, we had requested 7.5 million for this particular piece that was funded. And so we're putting in a request to Senator Murray's office for the remaining 2.5 uh, million, and that's due on Friday. We're putting together for, the, for a raise grant, the um, Rebuild America's Infrastructure. Um, we're putting to, in the freight, uh, the Freight, uh, Thurston Regional Freight Strategy that has been one of our unfunded pieces of work for a number of years now. We are putting together an application for that, for the raise grant. Um, a, little, a reminder or a heads up that we've got a lot going on right now. So it is likely that we're gonna need to call to our TPB meetings for the next few meetings to, to make sure that we get through everything that we need to get through. Um, we've talked a bit about the transportation and equity poll that we're going to be putting out to the region. That's going to be coming out shortly. Uh, and so we'll be looking for help to get that distributed so we can get as many responses as possible. Um, we just updated the Rural Transit ERT writer, Writer's Guide. 
And we now have a printed and online version in Spanish, which is a nice improvement for us. Um, we just found out yesterday that FEMA selected um, Thurston County Multi-Jurisdictional Hazard Mitigation Plan update uh, for a, a grant for a um, pre-disaster mitigation grant. The award is 166,000 and some change and the local share is uh, 55,000. And that work is gonna get started. Actually, Paul Brewster, can you help? Because when is when will that work actually be conducted? Yeah, we'll probably start kicking it off this summer. And I, I just wanna highlight, uh, this is the fourth edition of this plan. So when it's complete, it will represent 20 years of hazard mitigation planning here in our region. So pretty major feat for our communities. Thank you, Paul. And then um, also just a reminder, because it's come up in questions uh, every now and then, um, I'm, I'm representing uh, Thurston Regional Planning Council and the, the regional transportation planning organizations on um, the autonomous vehicle committee that's convened by Secretary of Transportation. So um, uh, periodically, and we're planning to do one soon because folks have asked for an update uh, to have an update on what what the state is doing to get ready for um, automated vehicles in the future. And also, um, the county is convening a broadband action team, which is great to see. Um, and this is something that you heard about from Russ Elliott from Commerce at the, I think, two meetings ago. Um, and so, and I'll, and I'll be representing TRPC on that. So uh, lots going on right now. Thank you, Chair. Great, thank you. Um, with that, can I get a motion to approve uh, today's agenda? So move, General Callahan. Second, Carolina Mejia. A motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Is there any opposed? Then the motion carries. Aye. Next up is the approval of the meeting notes from April 14th. No approval, John O'Callaghan. Second. Second, like Don Malnick. <laughs> uh, I was going to die for lack of motion. <laughs> <laughs> motion. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? Then that motion carries as well. And now we're to our public comment period. And we do have one person who signed up for public comment. Raina, uh, she's on today. Uh, Chair, she did There's... not sign into the meeting. OK. Well, um, if she does sign in, um, I will use my chair's prerogative and be able to get back to her um, if that happens. So we will then go into our next agenda item, which is the our uh, policy board bylaws, the final technical changes. Uh, Karen. Yes, good morning. Um, I just wanted to remind folks that we have had conversations over the last few months regarding our bylaws and made several changes to them, uh, including uh, adding a second vice president, vice president, vice chair position, um, and uh, also making some changes in that nomination process. Uh, we also talked about having the emeritus representative be from any of our long-term members, so removed the business um, name from that or designation. And so, so, <laughs> uh, and so uh, at the last meeting, uh, one of the members asked that we change some of the language to make it plural, gender neutral. And so I made that last change. And so today we're coming before you to ask for you to adopt the new bylaws. No problem. Make it. One second. Yeah. Uh, Don, are you second? Yep. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing then, all in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Is anyone opposed? That motion carries. And we've updated our bylaws. 
And then we'll go on to our next agenda item, which is the Policy Board uh, second vice chair nominations. Back to you, Karen. Okay, thank you. Um, now that you've adopted the changes to the bylaws, we wanted to put them in action. And one of those was to add, as I mentioned, a second vice chair position. And our process would be that between now and the next meeting, you would send nominations in writing and we would ask that you send those to Berlina. Uh, and in the after meeting summary, we will have her contact information. And um, we will also be, the chair will be um, taking nominations from the floor at our next meeting as well. So all this is, is just asking you to send nominations in advance in writing. And then uh, we will have that on our agenda next month to um, um, choose a second vice chair. And then um, after we get this going, it'll go back to the regular first of the year. Yes, we, uh -huh. this, this is an you know, out of sync election, but this will be for a term of the rest of this year. Great, is there any other questions? Seeing none, then we will go on to our 2021 uh, legislative session. Back to you, Karen. Finally to you, Karen. Karen. We keep <laughs> you off every meeting. Sorry, I think there was Karen. a question. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I did have a question. Um, when we send in the written nominations, uh, what all do you need? Do you just need a name or do you need a, like, something written about the person and campaign fund money don't worry don't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> just a name is all we need okay thank you and it obviously has to be a member of this board <laughs> okay sense. so uh the chair asked that we put this a little higher on the agenda uh this time and uh I decided this looked like the way that session felt with, you know, uh, Zoom meetings with all of our legislators. So uh, the legislature did adjourn uh, signing die on April 25th. Uh, next slide. And um, I wanted to remind you of just how many priorities we were looking at this session that we were, um, bringing to our legislators, this is important and this is important and this is important. So in the transportation arena, it was our I-5 project, the rural Thurston County Main Street project, support for growing and maintaining public transportation, which would be inner city transit, as well as RT, um, preserving and maintaining the multimodal system and finishing projects. Next slide. And then we had kind of a family category, not that transportation doesn't affect uh, families, but childcare and early learning. There was really an emphasis on that crisis of childcare in our community. Broadband, uh, we've all learned this year that uh, perhaps we didn't have as good a broadband service as we thought we did. Mental health, addiction treatment, and transition services, that being as people move into society, back into the more general society after they have had um, treatment, how do we help them to survive and to thrive? Uh, housing and homelessness, and with a specific emphasis on camping on state lands, and then looking at how do we deal with affordable housing? And how do we balance that energy, um, efficiency, and affordable housing, which is a real challenge uh, right now. Next slide. Um, so then there was local government and the environment. And uh, as you know, we have shared revenues like the Transportation Improvement Board and other um, areas of shared revenue. And we always want to make sure that we ask the state to keep that funding going, coming to the local level that we, that is a partnership. And often when there are problems with uh, funding issues, then they uh, tend to go, okay, we're going to take this money. And I understand that, but we'd like them not to do that. And then the environment, we were looking at removing barriers to um, implementing our local plans. And this was more of a hint this session 
the region is just fine, just finalized the um, Olympia, Lacey, Tumwater, and Thurston County have just finalized the, the first part of the climate mitigation plan and they're continuing to work. So we assume next session, there will be more specifics about what state law might get in the way of what we're wanting to do here. And then investing in mitigation lands um, for gophers so that uh, building can continue. Next slide. So what we learned, this is just a few numbers. They adjourned on time. They passed 340 bills. The governor has signed 192 of them. And that was true as of yesterday. Um, and he has done two partial vetoes. Uh, the remote session in general worked. We did have access to our members. Uh, it was, the hard part was the, um, the, easiness of grabbing a legislator in the hallway obviously wasn't happening, but we ended up with some long meetings with our legislators via Zoom or other tools. Um, this one is really interesting, and I just heard this from um, representatives that were speaking about the session. So in the 2020 session, 18,700 people signed in to testify. This session, 67,700 people signed in to testify. Wow. So the ability to testify remotely, to not have to take a day off work, drive, um, perhaps a long distance, figure out how to park, um, all of those things, childcare, all of that uh, really made it easier for people to testify. There were some issues with that in that when you have 3,500 people sign in to testify for a single bill and you have a two hour meeting with a number of bills, then are people getting a chance to really speak? People also took mm -hmm. advantage of written testimony a lot this year. So no matter what the legislative session looks like uh, in the next session, as far as whether it's remote or hybrid, I'm making an assumption that we were, this legislature will still want people to be able to sign in remotely to testify. And then I just wanted to mention, since we were looking at telework issues, and we'll be talking about that later the, today in the meeting, um, that basically the capital campus rate of telework was about 6% before um, COVID, it's 80 to 90%. Uh, and starting to change a little, but we're still, in, still seeing a really high rate of telework. And some folks like the Secretary of Transportation who are really committed to um, encouraging uh, folks to continue teleworking. And uh, we have heard from both the House and Senate that they will continue to let employees telework during the interim. And uh, for the Senate, that's like forever as far as they're concerned. They're also providing stipends for their employees to um, help support them at home. Next slide. So what we learned was, oops, there's an extra bullet. The legislature was serious about limiting the transportation projects. So the fact that we got $5 million in the budget for the I-5 project is a miracle. And really uh, everyone helped to make that happen. Um, but Representative Barkas, who was uh, managing transportation for the House R's, really is devoted to this project. And so a big thank you to him. Uh, the next thing is that we had too many priority issues. It was hard to get through all of our issues. So we're going to need to, to really focus for the next session on not 20 issues, but maybe five back to that again. And then as we prepare for the session, I think it's gonna be really interesting that we that we see how things move forward, tax increment financing being one of the big ones that passed this year. Um, it will be important for us, even if we're not ready to implement them at the jurisdictional level, that we look at those pieces of legislation, see if there are problems with them and um, try and remedy that early next session. Uh, the legislature likes to provide tools to the local government. They start reminding us when we don't use them. Hey, we gave you this, why aren't you using it? So let's really uh, look at what would get in the way of us implementing um, what was passed this session. Next slide. So there was giant legislation. It felt like a tidal wave sometimes. Next slide. Um, 
there's always exciting things, but again, the $5 million for the bridges, uh, a real emphasis on mental health care. I, I guess from a um, citizen, resident of this state, I really appreciated the way the legislature looked at issues from a variety of sides. So in addition to providing more funding for mental health, there were bills that did things like let's um, allow people to do kind of some of their residency requirements in um, if they're in mental health services online so that we can get these people in the field sooner. So there was really a, a broad look at what could be applied to help problems. Same with childcare and early, early learning. There was everything from more funding to, hey, if we were building an early learning facility, let's look at providing some relief from impact fees. Equity was everywhere. I think there's probably, it was probably in most bills, but there were, uh, 15 or 20 bills that specifically dealt with equity in medical uh, training and the way we handle medicine in wages, in housing, in schools. So that was really uh, emphasized this session and will continue to be. Um, I also don't want to say that we've never talked about equity before in the legislature. It's often uh, part of uh, the bills that come forward, but it was specifically called out in more this year. Next slide. Um, obviously broadband, we looked at broadening the organizations that could provide broadband and other kinds of telecommunication services talked about using the highway right of way to provide uh, for broadband access. So again, a, a nice round 360 degree look at what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, an emphasis on manufacturing. Michael Cade from the Economic Development Council told me he didn't think this was gonna pass. Uh, and yet there were several bills that dealt with how do we make manufacturing uh, more viable in our communities again. And so there's funding and other opportunities to help that happen. I mentioned before tax increment financing, that is huge. Capital gains tax is huge. Um, neither of these have been signed yet by the governor, but um, I haven't heard that he plans on vetoing them. Next slide. And then uh, climate and energy issues, the hydrofluorocarbon, um, again, looking at clean fuels, providing customer support for building cool roofs and trees, uh, forest management, and this is important for a variety of reasons. Most recently, our discussion has been around our climate mitigation plan and carbon sequestration and what does that look like? And so some tools for managing forests and it's wrapped into some of the um, wildland fire kinds of um, conversations. So we're looking at the people that are preserving forests for um, agricultural purposes and other purposes. And we're also looking at it from a sense of um, how do we do better job of um, protecting our environment and people uh, with wildfires. Cap and invest, rate making, ride sharing, commit to production programs. So the whole way that we're looking at energy and greenhouse gases, uh, several bills around that. And then electric vehicle infrastructure, looking at tax incentives, mapping. Uh, one that I was not as aware was a pro that was as much of a problem was the forecasting the need. So the electric companies, the providers, um, there are new requirements that they need to become much more efficient at um, projecting if by 2030 we're all driving electric vehicles, do we have the infrastructure in place for that to happen? And the answer right now is often no. And so looking at really trying to support that. Next slide. So, and then there's just a few more. Some of our rural communities in particular, Rainier has been interested in uh, parks and recreation districts. And there were some changes to that law. Um, one that Thurston County has been interested in, uh, an additional superior court position. There are a lot of um, 
issues that come to a, uh, Thurston County uh, for a variety of reasons. So there's a huge caseload and this provides another judge. And then a recognition that um, especially with so many people working at home on their own devices, we all kind of went through a change and recent events in the news that cybersecurity is becoming even more important. So a new office of cybersecurity. Next slide. There was also a few things that I think are um, strong enough to mention as policies and goals. So the first one I had mentioned, this is doubling the state's manufacturing employment base in 10 years. The energy, preserving affordable energy services to the residents of the state, flexibility in pricing, and then requires state transportation agencies to perform their duties with preservation and safety being priorities. So beyond just passing these bills, there were intent statements in here that said, <clears throat> we expect this to be a matter of policy. Next slide. And my last slide. So it isn't that many months till January, 2022. Um, they're having conversations about how the uh, session will happen. <clears throat> the more we hear about hybrid kinds of um, meetings and gatherings and legislative sessions, the more uh, we struggle with what that looks like. So I have no prediction other than at least the testimony will likely be remote. Re uh, remote. Also, um, there's always rumors of special sessions. It's how we torture ourselves, you know, during the interim is to think, oh, they're going to come back into session. Um, there's a good deal of federal money being talked about out there, and um, it's possible that we would come back if there are some state decisions to be made about that, especially about distribution across the state. <clears throat> and then the big transportation package didn't happen. So that's just the one that would include um, changes, raising gas tax, changing other fee structures to support more funding for transportation. And um, I don't know, uh, every day you could hear a different rumor on whether they're going to want to try and tackle that before next session or wait. We certainly saw this session, the um, proposals from both the House and Senate, as well as some ex other proposals. And so we'd be watching for that. I will send out the updated tracker um, with the after meeting summary and don't hesitate to get in touch if there are particular issues that you'd like me to look into for you. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions for Karen? I do, I do have one question. You mentioned something about parks and rec districts. Does that affect metropolitan park districts, Karen? Um, it was the creation of parks districts. And I don't think there was a change in ones that were already created. So let me get more detail on that for you. Thank you. Uh, Danny? Yeah, I have a question about the tax increment financing. When I when we first were presented to that by the uh, AWC, you know, I see it as an opportunity to capture value uh, on public investments. Um, and since then, I've recently heard that it's been used in not so good ways across the country. So, uh, it leading to you know racist outcomes and stuff like that. So, was that part of the discussion from the legislature? And do you know if there were guardrails built in to? to make sure that we do it right in Washington? Um, my understanding is that that was brought up. I mean, we heard it on the floor, but it was also brought up in other kinds of conversations. There are concerns about tax increment financing. It's one of the reasons why it hasn't passed before now. And so what I have heard is that there are guardrails built in, but um, I don't know if they prevent everything that's ever happened <laughs> negatively. I think it would be a good idea to ask um, Association of Washington Cities to come back and talk to us about what the final legislation looks like. And it would probably be in the fall because it's, it takes a little bit to figure out <laughs> what's in that multi-page bill. And, um, and so that's what I would do is ask them to come back and talk to you all about that. 
Absolutely. I think that'd be a great idea. And of course, the proof is in the pudding. And I just want to say, Karen, it's so nice to finally get a legislative update from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, yeah. apparently we just run out of time because we like to talk. <laughs> I, I, I agree that the tax increment financing is such a huge change. And um, I have seen it done very successfully uh, in other parts of the United States. And I've heard really good things. Um, it's obviously you're, you're capturing the increased value. And so where, where, where you've heard some things go wrong is when, you, when you've gone into some poor areas, right? Um, and, that, and then it's, it's kind of completely changed, you know, the, uh, the landscape in, in those areas. Uh, so anyway, there's, there's some good and, and some bad when it comes to these things, but it'd be great to hear how we're gonna try to implement in, in, in Washington. Uh, John, do you have something? Yeah. Uh, did they did they even begin to discuss how they're going to make energy affordable, especially since we're we're eliminating this year all the coal fire plants that we have? For example, Centralia's uh, should be closing down if it's not already closed down. Yes, absolutely. It's that transition is part of the conversation all the time. How do we get from here to here, even if the future there are some assumptions that it will be less expensive. There's that transition period and how long is it? So those discussions are going on. It especially came up around affordable housing and how do we make housing uh, energy efficient and how do we still have it be affordable, uh, especially right now considering the price of building materials. Um, and uh, so the discussions are had, did they find all the answers? No but uh, I think they're gonna be continuing to have that. My understanding is there will be some interim sessions around that. So when I find out about those, I'm happy to let you know about them and you can listen to some of those. You know, During the interim, they dig in and do a few more studies uh, in depth and there are some studies in the budget for that. So did they have all the answers? No, but are they talking about it? Yes. That's good to know, because uh, the reason that I bring it up is, is uh, we had the president saying that by, was it 20, 2030 or 2035, and you've got some car manufacturers saying by 2035 that they will not have any more gasoline uh, powered vehicles. Uh, where are we going to get the power to charge all those vehicles up, knowing that we're closing a lot of plants down? Yep. So it, it's a transition we're all going to be watching closely. Uh, if you hear anything you think you can have somebody come and give us an update, please. I can do that. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? I got Let's lots see. of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know where to find me, John. <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, so um, then let's go on to our next agenda item, which is our ethics and non-discrimination policy review. Dina. All right, good morning. Um, so um, I'm here to do just some housekeeping policy review with you today. Um, TRPC has an ethics and non-discrimination policy that apply not only to staff, but also to our board members. And so um, our ethics policy was updated three years ago, so you would have all been briefed on that, but we think it's timely to bring it back forward to you every three or so years. Plus, um, new members should get this in their orientation package. The um, changes are fairly small, but I thought there's a few other things I want to highlight in our ethics policy for you all today, because they've come up over past meetings. So our ethics policy is put in place um, just to ensure that we do not have a conflict of interest or an appearance of conflict of interest. And so it goes through different um, categories. And I really would encourage you all to read it all in detail. I'm just gonna go over a few highlights today. Um, one of the housekeeping changes we made is we made it gender neutral. Um, with all our policies, we'll be doing that. Um, so one of the areas that always comes up is gifts and favors. Um, when you're acting as a representative of TRPC, so this ethic policy applies to you all when you're acting on our behalf, not in your other functions of your life. Um, there, um, we ask that you don't accept gifts other than the exceptions below. And these exceptions are basically from the state law 
or state um, guidance. And so it's okay to um, take de minimis gifts if they are given to you. Um, another one would be ones where if it's a gift from a tribe or dignitary from another state and it would be seen as disrespectful not to accept the gift, then you can, you're allowed to take that. Um, or um, if you are at an ex um, a reception at a conference and um, a vendor is providing some food, that's fine, that sort of thing. Um, this applies to TRPC staff. We're just, um, we can't take incompatible employment. So not, we can't have a job here as well as a consulting company, for instance, that uh, might compete with TRPC or go for TRPC contracts. Yeah. So this sort of extra uh, employment we could do would be say coaching a basketball team or something like that, that has absolutely zero conflict of interest. Um, Acquiring an interest, this one is, um, I wanna highlight here, it keeps coming up because you all make recommendations about um, projects and many of you represent jurisdictions who receive the funding for those projects. Uh, it comes up as, are we, is there a conflict of interest of approving a award for my jurisdiction? And the answer is no, there is no conflict of interest there. When you're acting on behalf of, in a public position and on behalf of your organization, there's an inherent conflict in that you are, also, you are required to be part of our board and we give out money to local jurisdictions. Therefore, you can't have a conflict of interest there. Um, it, it's just part of your responsibilities to, as part of your board. And, um, and we are just designed to balance local interests against each other and then come to, and you make a recommendation on funding. Essentially a conflict of interest arises if it's for private gain, but not for the public good. And so you're acting in the public good when you're making those decisions. Um, I'm gonna just jump over this, um, but basically, this is all just about keeping information you hear in an executive session confidential. It doesn't apply to the policy board as much as our council where they might have executive sessions. Um, if for instance, um, hiring an executive director or doing their evaluation. We tend to not have very many of those. Um, we can't enter into a contract um, with you all or any of our um council members or, or any of your businesses. So we have to keep our agency business separate from if you have a private business, your private business. Um, <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why um, we try not to have a um, private firm that would work on one of the projects that we award as a member of the policy board, as a business representative, because they're potentially could be a conflict of interest and they certainly would have an appearance of conflict of interest if that was the case. Um, where we did update um, the policy was our non-discrimination, just added um, additional categories based on federal law just to capture, but to be fully inclusive. And um, we also made those changes in our non-discrimination policy and they are in line with our non-discrimination section of our personnel policies. So we're just trying to sync everything up and make it a little bit more inclusive. Why did you name, um, point out over 40 on aid? Um, yeah, because that's what the law is that you can't discriminate on age based on someone being over 40. We could take the over 40 off and just say age um, either way. Okay. As somebody under 40, um, I would appreciate if we took that out because I can tell you that younger people are often treated as though we're inexperienced and don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. I that appreciate was, that. Yeah, I think in our personnel policies, it's very specific in terms of um, when you can file a claim of discrimination as opposed to we should not discriminate against anybody. But um, so, yes, I will make that tweak. Thank you. Um, just as a reminder, um, we have restrictions on lobbying and we have to disclose that as an agency. Um, Karen and Mark would walk you through that with our ledge session, although we don't lobby, we advocate for our projects. And then um, employee, this relates to employees. We're part of, because we receive so much federal funding um, under the Hatch Act. So if, so during campaign time, when employees don't respond to anything they 
may inadvertently get sent to our employee email. It's because we have restrictions on any political activity relating to um, when we are part of our agency. As in our personal lives, we can do what we want, but as we represent the agency, we have lots of restrictions. And um, I think that's about it. Those were the major points I wanted to pass on. Does anyone have any specific questions about this policy? My only question is, is do we sign, should we be signing this like on a yearly basis where, where what, what is, what is the <clears throat> rule there? I know in, on some other boards, you know, I, I sign it every year. Um, but oh, I can't okay. Sign this. Um, I've never signed one like this and I've been mm -hmm. since 96. <laughs> that, it's a great question. Um, maybe Mark and I can talk about that, but um, we have never had you sign. We've just presented it to you. And then... I mean, I we should probably sign it. <laughs> it's one thing to have a have a policy, and it's another, you know, to acknowledge the policy and sign it. I mean, that's just my sense, but yeah, I guess you guys can talk about. It. Well, we'll check in with our in insurance provider because for a lot of this, it's it's. About um, liability and such, and so um, we're insured by WCIA. That can't be a new question for, for them. So we'll we'll check in with them on that. Thank you, Chair. Yep. Any other questions? So um, this is just a review. Are you going to come back to us for for the actual changes, or do you need a vote on it? No, um, this will go to our council at their next meeting for adoption. So it was more for just get your input and let you know what the changes were. Um, yep. Makes sense. Any, any other questions? Okay. All right, and thank you. Then let's go on to our billable lands report. Okay. Allison. Morning. So. Yeah, I'm Michael Mbergi here with Allison Osterberg, and we're here to give you an update on the Billable Lands Report that TRPC has been working on. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Everyone see that all right? Yep. Great. So Billable Lands. So the Billable Lands Program is a requirement under the Washington State Growth Management Act. Uh, GMA sets aside or identifies 13 goals that cities and counties across <coughs> Washington State should be planning towards. And it kind of sets up the framework for planning within Washington State. So under those 13 uh, GMA goals, uh, you have the countywide planning policies, which are the collective goals of um, each county and the jurisdictions of cities within it. The county in each uh, jurisdiction, each city has their own comprehensive plans and then the development regulations with uh, underneath that. And the intent here is that the development regs should be consistent with the city or county's vision. Those should be uh, consistent with the countywide planning policies and all of that should be consistent with the GMA goals. The Billable Lands Report was a, an amendment to GMA that was added in 1997 and it was essentially, um, the intention was for the fastest growing counties in Western Washington it would require them to evaluate their development trends and to look at their projections to make sure that the growth that they're seeing is actually consistent with their comp plan, countywide planning policy goals, and those uh, GMA land use goals. And if an inconsistency is found, so if we're not developing in a way that's consistent with our, our goals, we need to identify reasonable measures. And those reasonable measures would then have to be adopted as part of the next round of period comprehensive plan updates. So again, it's a chance to look at development trends, uh, evaluate them to make sure they're consistent with our, our region's goals, and then to identify corrective measures that we would have to implement um, in, in case we aren't. The Thurston County Billable Lands Report, uh, the 2021 report, we've divided into two different sections. So volume one looks at GMA goals, and this is where state the, the GMA and Billable Lands uh, statutes are fairly prescriptive about the metrics that we need to evaluate um, to ensure that we're um, developing in a way that's consistent with GMA's goals. So there's two things we look at. We look at achieved densities. So those would be the average residential densities, housing units per acre for new development. And then we also look at capacity. So we look at um, whether there's enough buildable land to accommodate 20 years worth of both housing growth, commercial development, industrial development, et cetera. 
Volume two of the report looks at some of our regional goals, and that's namely our Sustainable Thurston targets. The Sustainable Thurston was a community-wide planning project completed in 2013, and it identified a couple land use targets. So we use the second part of the Billable Lands Report to evaluate whether or not the growth patterns that we've seen and are projecting over the next 20 years are consistent with the Sustainable Thurston targets. We're going to go into um, some of these topic areas in a little bit more detail, show you some of the data, but just a, a quick preview of the report's findings. When we look at our development trends compared to GMA's goals, we're doing pretty well. So we're, we're, we did not find that reasonable measures are necessary. We are developing consistent with GMA. Where we're struggling a little bit is with those sustainable Thurston targets. Um, that's where we're not quite on track to meet those targets. So let's dive into these uh, a little bit, little bit more. So as I mentioned, the first thing that we look at in the report is achieved densities. So this would be, well, the intention here is that we want to make sure that the densities that we're seeing, the type of development that we're seeing within our urban areas is actually consistent with kind of urban character. And there's no kind of hard threshold for what an urban density is, but as a general rule of thumb, we use about four units per acre. So this chart shows um, the average density for new development um, within our cities, unincorporated UGAs, and then across both the cities and UGAs over the past 20 years. So when we look at densities across our urban areas, um, in the first part of the early 2000s, we were seeing densities of about 5.7 units per acre, and that's gone up to about over 10 units per acre, 10.6 units per acre for housing built in the past five years. So well above that four unit per acre threshold and densities that have been increasing over time. And just in general, we see higher densities in our cities compared to our UGAs. That increase in density that we've been seeing in our urban areas has really been driven by both the type of housing that's um, been constructed over the past five years and where that housing has been located. We've seen a lot more uh, housing development in our downtown areas along our urban corridors and kind of in our infill areas, those close to neighborhoods. And these are the parts of our, our urban areas that are zoned for the highest densities. So when we look at housing within our downtown areas and urban corridors, those would be again, downtown areas and kind of the, the areas adjacent to our rapid transit corridors. We see housing densities of well over 70 unit per, units per acre. So the increase in housing that we've seen, the new development that we've seen in those areas over the past five years has really driven that overall trend towards higher densities. So our findings within the report for densities, you know, we find that we are seeing urban densities within our urban areas, housing that's over four units per acre, and the densities are increasing over time. So these are two uh, positive things for meeting our GMA goals. The next topic that we look at is capacity. And when we talk about capacity, there's kind of two topics that we're looking at. We wanna know how much land is developable, and then based on zoning trends, how much housing could be built on that developable land. TRPC maintains a land capacity model just intended for this purpose. And it takes into account on a parcel by parcel level, um, any existing development that might be on a parcel, commercial buildings or housing. It looks at uh, what's allowed under zoning as well as kind of um, trends and average densities for each uh, zoning district. And it also looks at any environmental constraints that might limit development. So we kind of combine these three factors to come up with an estimate of, of those two topics, whether how much land is developable and how many dwelling units could be built on it. On the residential side, when we look at uh, capacity for new housing within our urban areas, uh, our model finds that there's about 85,000 housing units that are on the ground right now in Thurston County's uh, uh, incorporated and unincorporated urban areas. TRPC's model shows that there's capacity for about 50,000 new units. But when we compare that to the demand, uh, how much housing we actually expect to be built over the next 20 years, we find that the demand is for about 41,000 new units. So this gives us an excess capacity of about 18%. So the capacity for uh, new housing exceeds the demand uh, over the next 20 years by about 18%. Hmm. I'll believe that when I see it. <laughs> We go through a, a pretty similar uh, methodology for commercial industrial capacity or for commercial industrial lands. So kind of similar rundown here when we look at uh, 
commercial land, we find that there's about 2,400 acres of land that are developed right now for commercial purposes. DRPC's model estimates that there's about 2,200 acres that are available for commercial development. And we compare that to a need of about uh, 1,200 acres, giving us an excess capacity of 45%. On the industrial side, we have a little bit less industrial land uh, that's developed right now, about 1,100 acres, capacity for about 1,700 acres, and a projected need for about 200 acres of commercial, or excuse me, industrial space. So that gives an excess capacity of about 88%. I like to highlight here that the, you know, compared to the residential evaluation, the excess capacities for commercial industrial land are, are much higher. Um, and there's kind of a good reason for that. We we find that projecting the need for commercial industrial space is probably the hardest aspect of the buildable lands report. It's the thing that's most challenging for us to do because the exact amount of uh, land that's needed and the exact amount of building space that's needed really depends on the types of businesses that we see. So you could have two businesses that are in a similar industry, but their uh, space requirements and the land requirements could you know, dramatically differ. So having that larger amount of excess capacity really acts as a buffer to account for some of the uncertainty in our projections for commercial and industrial um, building space and land need. So again, the findings for uh, capacity within our urban areas. So the question is, is there sufficient billable land in the urban areas to accommodate 20 years of residential uh, development as well as commercial and industrial development? And we find that yes, there is sufficient land for both uh, housing and commercial industrial growth, acknowledging that there's a lot more uncertainty for our commercial industrial uh, needs. So again, going back to the elements of the, the Thurston County Buildable Lands Report, when we look at those GMA goals, you know, we're doing well for densities and we're doing okay for uh, capacity. And, and based on those findings, uh, reasonable measures are not necessary. So reasonable measures, again, being those corrective actions uh, that we would have to identify and that the cities would have to implement as part of their next round of comprehensive plan updates. And based on the findings of the 2021 report, we are we find that those measures are not necessary. Doesn't mean that everything's uh, okay right now. We definitely acknowledge that there are a lot of challenges, both to uh, realizing the capacity that we've projected and some uncertainties around our forecast. We've kind of highlighted a, a few key aspects here. So one big one that always comes up is infrastructure. In the in TRPC's analysis, we assume that development, or excuse me, the infrastructure will be extended as development occurs. So that includes uh, both sewer, water, you know, electricity, all those key infrastructures. As a new housing development goes in, the infrastructure will be extended to it. We recognize that there are a, a few areas within Thurston County's urban areas where either based on the topology of the, the area or based on just the, the distance from existing infrastructure, that sewer could potentially limit the uh, housing densities that we're projecting in the Bill of Lands report. So that would be one area of uncertainty. We also look at trends towards urban growth and, and rural growth. And there's been a lot of change over the past you know, year, especially due to the COVID pandemic. And that could kind of change the balance of housing that we see built in our urban areas versus our rural areas. So kind of on the urban side, you know, due to COVID, we're seeing a lot more um, migration. So Alice and I have been meeting with a number of stakeholders throughout the community. And one group that we met with was some real estate folks. And they're saying that they're seeing a lot more clients coming from um, outside of Washington State and from the, kind of the Seattle metro area looking for housing within Thurston County, um, both the urban areas and the rural areas. So big trends like that, which um, weren't necessarily evaluated as part of the report, could sway how much housing we actually see in different parts of the county. Another topic that I've called out is kind of the difficulty in developing rural lands. And this has come up a little bit over the past, um, through the update of this report as well. So will factors like uh, the availability, uh, the ability to get a permit exempt well in the rural areas or will endangered species lim listings, will that limit the ability to develop uh, rural lands and push more growth to the urban areas? Kind of on the rural side, again, just going back to the COVID and telework, you know, now that we have a lot more people teleworking and they can work work remotely and work from home, does that mean that we'll see a shift from our urban areas to our rural areas? And finally, the kind of last area of, um, I guess I would call this a challenge, is housing affordability. 
So our mandate under the buildable lands report is to evaluate whether there's enough um, buildable land and enough developable land within our urban areas to accommodate the growth, but we, we don't factor in the cost of developing that land. So housing affordability really isn't a, an issue that we get into with the report. So we're finding that there's enough buildable land to accommodate the development, but um, there could be some challenges around uh, actually developing that land in a way that's affordable for the people that are future residents of Thurston County. So again, a number of areas of challenge or a number of areas of uncertainty. And then I mentioned earlier sustainable Thurston. So at this point, I think I'm gonna hand it off to Allison to talk a little bit about um, kind of our regional goals. Great, thanks, Michael. Um, so as part of the Buildable Lands project this time around, we really wanted to look in addition to the GMA goals, how are we doing on our own regional goals that we set through Sustainable Thurston? And Sustainable Thurston was a community-wide conversation that uh, set out a vision for how Thurston County would look, function, and feel in what we wanted that to be in 2035. And it broke things down into different categories. There are strategies for the North County centers and corridors, having dense urban centers, uh, having a mix of options in residential neighborhoods around smaller hubs and in the South County communities, uh, focusing on economic development and maintaining a small town feel and then preserving rural character and critical habitat in our rural lands. Go ahead, next slide. And Sustainable Thurston is um, also a vision for for transportation, for how transportation would work. A lot of that is set on how are we providing services in an efficient way um, and how on our corridors um, will people be able to use transit to get around, walk, bike, access the services they need while limiting vehicle miles traveled. Uh, and what we're, what we're seeing right now uh, as part of the buildable lands and going into this is that while we are seeing denser development in our urban centers on our corridors, although we have mixed use zoning, we're actually not seeing a lot of mixed use development. So right now we will have uh, different types of development that's happening there, but it's not, not always particularly mixed use, a mix of residential and specifically. The concept of neighborhood centers is also something that we looked at. How can we, in the neighborhoods around um, in our urban areas that are that are a little bit farther off of those downtown areas and those main corridors, we're also part of the sustainable Thurston vision was that we would have these neighborhood centers where people could concentrate. They would have um, a small amount of commercial area where they they could get a cup of coffee or some some simple groceries or just things to meet their daily needs. And that would enable people also to limit their car trips and reduce vehicle miles traveled. And in our rural areas, part of the concentration would be by focusing housing development, concentrating that density in our urban areas. Uh, it um, limits the amount of congestion we're seeing from people settling at a higher proportion in the rural areas. Next slide. So Sustainable Thurston had two land use targets and um, those targets were, the first one was that at least 95% of new housing between 2010 and 2035, which was our target for Sustainable Thurston would be located within the urban areas. And what we see now is that uh, we're not on track to meet that target. So we're, we, although it goes, it's gone, gone up and down uh, we see today we've had about 86% of the growth since 2010 has been located in urban areas and projecting out through the buildable lands work we see under the current, if we were just to carry it forward the way we're going now about 87% would be located in urban areas so not not hitting that target. And next slide. And the second target is that by 2035, 72% of all households in our urban areas would be within a half mile of an urban center corridor or neighborhood center. So again, they would have those households, 72% would have access within a pretty easy walking distance 
of resources, uh, shops, and things to meet their daily needs and allow them to not make all those trips by car. And what we see with this target is that we are on track to make some improvements. Um, so we've been averaging since 2010 about 49% of the growth. We, we, right now, where we're at about 49% of the areas in our urban areas are concentrated in centers and corridors. And with some of the changes to regulations and some of the development that's in the pipeline, when we look out to 2035, that would increase to about 57%, but still well below our target of 72%. The next slide. So for volume two, for the regional goals of the Buildable Lands Report, we worked with a uh, stakeholder advisory committee made up of different representatives in the community. So staff from all the cities and jurisdictions, many of our partners like LOT and inner city transit, as well as representatives from um, the building industry, realtors, different citizens with environmental concerns. So to come up with recommendations about what we, how we might approach these regional targets. And I'll highlight those just quickly. There's more information in the report if you want to dig into it. Uh, but in general, what they, they came together and said that yes, the, the sustainable Thurston land use vision is still one that we should be uh, working toward. It still is a viable um, vision and one that people agreed would be beneficial and is one that, that we should all regionally be striving for. But one thing they did said in our general recommendations is that the time frame limiting it to 2035 is um, potentially not where, not the right cutoff, uh, that our market is just starting to change to support the type of growth that we're envisioning in sustainable Thurston and we may want to look out on a longer time frame. Another general recommendation from that group was to have folks look at uh, that it would be really important to articulate the trade-offs of the type of development that we might see when a development is located in a way that doesn't meet the sustainable person. That there be a, um, a way of understanding what the trade-offs of that might be to uh, public health, to housing affordability, to climate change, uh, because these targets Sustainable Thurston land use targets were adopted in the Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan. So any development that maybe doesn't meet this goal will make it harder for us to meet some of our other regional goals. And that should be understood when they're being permitted. We also looked at what would be some options for urban centers and corridors to see, particularly in our corridors, how can we see the type of denser growth that we are starting to see in our city, in our city centers? And um, how might that change things? And in the broader urban areas, urban growth areas, we talked about strategies uh, similar to some of the things that have been done to encourage a greater mix of, of housing types um, and also to look at those infrastructure constraints. Another area we looked at with neighborhood centers, when we have a lot of areas that are sort of designated as neighborhood centers, they're maybe not functioning, functioning the way that we thought they, we hoped that they would in the sustainable thirst and vision. And so what might be some ways to do that? Um, there are some recommendations for the South County communities and also for rural and resource <coughs> lands. How can we better protect, particularly our natural resource lands around agriculture and forests? So go ahead to the next slide. And what we saw when we looked at different strategies we might do uh, to meet those recommendations, for that first target, we could get within 1% of our target. So rather than 87% of new housing being in the urban areas with, the, with some of the changes we identified, we could still get up to 94%, so pretty close, particularly. And, and I think if we were looking at a longer time frame, which is one of the recommendations, we would be able to achieve that target. Next slide. For the second target, the strategies, again, would, would definitely make a difference. Uh, so you would see 66% of our growth within the urban areas within a half mile of an urban center corridor or neighborhood center. And that's still an improvement over that 57%. And again, that might be something because we're looking at all growth, not just the new growth uh, that might change over time if we have a longer time frame. <coughs> Next slide. So um, 
We're coming to the end of the buildable lands process. Michael and I have been giving a lot of presentations to wrap this up. We are, our next steps are to we'll provide a briefing to the Board of County Commissioners for sort of the ultimate client for the buildable lands report. And it will come to TRPC. Uh, they've had their first review and they'll come to accept the plan in June. And then we provide the report to the Department of Commerce so under our agreement. And that information is really meant to be used by the cities and the county in their comprehensive plan updates. And it's important to remember that buildable lands is, um, we look at trends, we look at the best information we have, um, it kind of paints a picture of what could happen, but it's up to the jurisdictions and part of the public process to say, is that really the vision that we want? Are there things that we could do to change it? And that's a conversation um, that buildable lands can be a tool to facilitate those discussions as part of comprehensive plan updates. And with that, we will take any questions. Can you um, stop sharing your screen, please? Yes. Do we have some questions, Pete? Well, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for the, for the work on this. I did take a look at the report to so back up this presentation. I, I would agree that um, First of all, neighborhood centers are a challenge. We, we designated neighborhood centers around the Tumwater and uh, city limits in UGA, and they have not really uh, um, come to be. And I think one of the challenges is your typical small grocery store on the corner just can't make it under the, given the cost of commercial development. Uh, and uh, I'm not really sure what the solution to that is, but uh, almost all of the areas we originally designated as neighborhood commercial, we've eliminated because they're now wanting to make those residential areas. So, so I don't, I don't really again know the solution, but I think, I think uh, that is, if that's an important element of reducing car trips, then somebody's got to figure this out. Um, um, part, of, part of the challenge uh, in our large urban growth areas, very small part of it's actually served by bus service. And so a lot of our outlying areas, even though they're within so-called city limits, um, there's no, no way for them to reduce car trips. So, so I, I didn't see that really discussed in the report, and I think that's an important part of this. Similarly, uh, well, differently, frankly, uh, the rural development, I mean, as I drive around the county, I'm seeing a lot of rural development occurring. And, I, and when I look at your projections, uh, particularly a slide, the last slide, 18, but even the two earlier slides, um, I didn't see any of the actual data in the report backing up those those slides. I just saw dots on a graph. The, the actual data backing up those dots is not presented in the report. So it's a, it's a little hard for me to, to look at your projections and how they were made. But if you look at the last three or four years of what percent of development is occurring in the rural areas uh, versus urban areas, it's very, it, it, it's to me, it, that straight line projection is wrong. Uh, it's going that if you actually look at what's happening out there, there's a lot more rural development occurring. And um, so I don't have any confidence at all that we're getting close to where we wanna be under that urban vision. And I, I don't know how you made those projections saying that you think we're gonna get there with these changes. Uh, again, there's no data presented in the report backing that up. Now, it's not really needed as part of GMA, but I think if we're going to present that, there needs to be some technical information backing up those graphs. Uh, again, I, I just think that we're, we're heading on a path where we're seeing a lot of urban sprawl outside of our urban growth areas and city limits. And um, I... I really think we need to start looking at stronger tools to try and prevent that if indeed that's our vision. And I'm not sure this report really fairly characterizes what's going on out there at this point. And maybe it's just a, 
um, a reflection of the the lag in the data. But um, well, I think I I I'll, I agree with you here, Pete. Um, the, what's driving the growth of housing is the cost of housing, right? And so as long as it remains less expensive uh, to to build. Um, you know, in the rural areas, which it is, um, that's where the housing's gonna go. Uh, and that's just, the, that's what's going on right now. Um, you know, to build within the urban core is is considerably more expensive. And than to build, you know, out on an acre in, in rural Thurston County. And so, um, I mean, it, that's, it is what it is, but, I, I would agree uh, that the growth is going to go where it's the where it, it's the least expensive, you know, to build. Um, and I don't know how we how we change that. Well, yeah. well certainly, certainly one tool that's not mentioned in the report that I think is going to be a major a major tool is as the city of Tumwater and the county and now Yelm buy up prairie land for mitigation land that that should start to tie up thousands of acres of land in the rural areas under conservation easements and, and help help with that. But, um, you know, that's that's gonna take years to, to come about. And in the meantime, all these areas are gonna get filled in with urban development, essentially suburban level development. So I, I just think the report, um, again, while we're technically meeting the GMA uh, uh, requirements, really understates the challenge of the rural sprawl that we're seeing and, and how we what we need to do to try and address that. Well, sorry, especially sorry how, going. how do we have, what are the strategies to address it too? I mean, this is, it's a, re, it's a report out, but, um, and it says that we're on track, but, I, I, I tend to agree. I don't, it doesn't feel like we're on track. And so it feels like we, we do need some strategies to, and to get there. And uh, Doug? Can I just, go ahead. I just wanted to respond to a couple points there. One is that I think what we see, what we saw in the Buildable Lands Report is that we are on track for what the state expects for us under GMA. And we are not, we are not on track to meet our own regional goals. Um, and we are not, particularly for the urban-rural split, we are not in tra track to change anything. It hasn't changed much since 2010. We've been cold and steady at about 86%, and we are going to stay there in the future. Um, and so that doesn't put us on track. I think what we looked at, and um, Michael would know more about the data that goes in there, but what, one thing that came up a lot was that the regulatory tools that we found in many cases for neighborhood centers, for, co for corridors are in place, but the market factors, there's, there's a, a private market consideration and you guys hit it on the head, the cost of developing in our urban centers is high and the cost of putting a, gro a small grocery store in a neighborhood center, it doesn't pencil out for people. And so we, they need to get more creative at looking at, at partnerships that would bring in the type of development that we wanna see. Uh, so those are some of the strategies that we started discussing in our, in our group, but those are things for the cities and the county and folks to, to continue thinking about going forward. Doug? Uh, am I on, on, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, my question deal around the, the 800 pound gorilla that is merely brushed off by uh, then and that certainly is the question of affordability. And what, what issues can we do or address or take on to address that issue? Uh, it's, it's not affordable to build affordable housing within the urban growth area. What's worse is that we're seeing increasing trends and costs that are making more and more people either homeless or at least in, endangered in terms of the amount of money they spend on housing. And I, we have a major area there that I don't think are really concerned addressed with at all. And yet it, it would impact uh, greatly whether at 
20% actually is available or whether it really isn't available? So a couple of things that we can talk about with uh, housing affordability. One is that when the legislature amended some of the billable land statutes, uh, the most most recently, they did add some requirements towards affordable housing. So as part of that, they directed Commerce to develop some guidance on housing affordability. So that's not something that's addressed in each county's individual um, buildable lands report, but that is something where Commerce, the legislature identified as an, a priority, and Commerce has developed some guidance for um, cities and counties when they update their comp plans to address uh, housing affordability. The other thing that was kind of a the great thing about the timing of doing the Buildable Alliance report this time around is that uh, the cities of Lacey, Olympian, and Tomwater were able to get some funding, again, from Commerce to develop a housing affordability, housing action plan to address that affordability side. So at the same time that we were updating the Buildable Lands report, those three cities were working with TRPC to develop a uh, regional housing action plan that could, could not kind of dive into this affordability issue. So even though it's not addressed, addressed directly in this report, I know the, the cities are doing a lot of work right now to um, identify some solutions to that housing affordability issue. Well, I sit on, on several of these housing plan groups and quite frankly, the, the real issue that they keep ducking is the question of affordability. Uh, it's all well and good to have nice plans and nice strategies and nice sounding words, but the reality is that uh, we have uh, increasing numbers of homelessness, increasing numbers of people who are, are cost burden one way or another. And uh, those are trends that, that unfortunately are not going down, they're going up. I see someone has raised their hand on the telephone. Go ahead. This is Kevin Kessinger. Okay. Um, I agree with Doug. Uh, I think it's weird that the, um, that Affordability is mentioned in the in the challenges section, um, but it's not mentioned in the recommendation section. And I wonder about the list of in in the recommendation section in parts of bullets five and six talks about things that can be used to encourage development, um, multifamily tax exemptions, parking requirements, impact fee waivers. A, I wonder if there's additional ones not listed there, like height requirements, density requirements, setback limitations, and other things like that. And I wonder whether, you know, I think, A, it's concerning that those have not yet been applied towards the nodes and the corridors, although I think, I think the missing middle effort did attempt to apply some of those to the, to the corridors. Um, but can any of those be applied towards affordable housing as well? Uh, Danny? Um, one thing that we've recently asked for in the city of Olympia on our land use and environment committee, uh, knowing that our housing action plan is uh, right around the corner is we've, uh, 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 we've got some funding uh, from our year end funds to do a kind of a housing market analysis. We're gonna be talking about the full scope of that, but um, you know, one place where the market is really starting to mature is downtown Olympia, uh, but not our urban corridors, not the east and west nodes, um, not our neighborhood centers. Um, and so I'm not sure what the full scope of this market analysis is gonna be, but we wanna be looking at you know, how what, what, what kind of tools we can use both for the density that we want, uh, but also for affordability as well, because we're also, we're, we're largely seeing market rate housing, which is important, but it does not include everybody. Um, I also, I really wanna appreciate the, um, the wider urban areas uh, part of this report and also uh, lift up Pete's comments about how, you know, access to public transit should also be considered in that component, not just, you know, infrastructure and sewer and stuff like that. And another thing that we're working on in Olympia uh, with the loss, uh, with, with the threatened loss of Spooner's uh, farm is you know, what, what about, you know, our capacity to grow food in the urban area? Um, there's a lot of uh, ties in our comprehensive plan that support urban agriculture, but also finding ways that urban areas can support preservation of rural agriculture. So um, 
uh, we're, we're, in, we're in a process right now uh, working with the Thurston Conservation District and the Community Farmland Trust to figure out what, what our role is for uh, agriculture preservation. Um, and one of the things we've talked about is like what maybe there's parts of our urban growth areas that it doesn't actually make sense to build and there's prime farmland there. Uh, Thurston Conservation District has actually done an analysis of all uh, active and potential farmland that currently exists in Olympia and the UGA. And so that's gonna be something that we use to, to guide our next steps. Um, uh, and I'm also very, very interested in the transfer development rights or land swaps, which I saw uh, mentioned in that memo. I think there's a lot of opportunity to uh, create more density specifically on transit lines and neighborhood centers um, uh, to, to preserve areas that we, uh, we make a, a specific goal of preserving. Um, and also just in regards to neighborhood centers, our planning commission is going to be taking that up again this year uh, and hopefully, hopefully we'll figure out what we can do uh, to really uh, boost neighborhood centers. I live two blocks from the Olympia Food Co-op and it is just amazing to be able to walk to the grocery store and I want so many more people to be able to do that. So I, I want to thank Michael and Allison real quick for, for uh, you know, I, I actually I found that memo um, uh, the, the memorandum in our packet, uh, really, really helpful in terms of connecting some of the work that we're doing in Olympia to some of the regional work that's going on. So thank you. Thanks, Danny. I, I'm really interested in, in hearing, um, you know, what Olympia comes up with, with with your studies as well, because, you know, we need to all be sharing that information. Uh, do, do we know when the report's going to come out on the corridor study? I, I mean, we've, I know that, uh, We've been working with TRPC to see that that Martin Way corridor study with some strategies behind it. When 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 is that going to be available? You mean the the final report for Martin yeah. Way? Yeah. That's probably going to be next year, um, sort of the earlier part of next year. But but we're actually on tap to come back to TPB next month and give an update on Martin Way. So I, I think there's actually Martin Way is a, is kind of a case study for a lot of these a lot of these issues that we see so it's been nice to be doing them in tandem because the it um there's some really specific examples on martin way that apply to some of the things we've looked at so i mean um, yeah. um, <laughs> i think martin way is prime for redevelopment but um again there's a there's a cost involved and so we could look at transfer development rights for that for the corridor or some other strategies like that that would be that'd be great so i'm looking forward to that does anyone else have any any questions, uh, Don? I just you sort of touched on in your good report the notion you did speak with re realtors and it's, the sense is maybe we're going to be really Im Im impacted by the Seattle exodus, exodus and the California exodus. And I'm wondering if you have any sense yet how that's going to is that really going to push things significantly? Do you think? It would highlight that as an area of uncertainty. I think so much has changed in the past 12 months that it's really to be determined how much of an impact that'll have on kind of the distribution of housing within our county long term. So we know we do update this report um, periodically. TRPC updates its um, population forecast um, roughly every three to five years. So I think the next time we do that, we'll have a much better sense of what the long term implications are. There's a lot of kind of competing things going on at the same time. There's just more people moving to Thurston County from out of the area. And then there's that kind of shift within the county of people moving from urban to rural areas. So uh, two different trends happening uh, simultaneously. Thank you. Uh, just want to add to, to what Don was talking about. Uh, I just got a study from uh, Tucson Regional Council. And among other things they say is they are two years behind in building sufficient housing within their own area. That means there's those people coming more and more down the road. Now, I, I, I get kicked that saying that we, we have more capacity than demand. There's, that's not, we're not even, yeah, there's so much demand right now, which, and it's skyrocketing the, the price it's, of housing. But it's expensive, they can pay the price. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's crazy. So I, I really think the housing affordability side needs a lot of, a lot of work and, and strategies to figure figure that piece out because there's just no way we're going to reach anywhere close to over capacity um, anytime soon. Not with the way the prices are right now. Yeah, and unfortunately, many uh, of our local communities can't afford it. I mean, I'm in the housing market. 
And me and my husband have been in the housing market for the past three years. And we've been constantly outbid every single time, usually by Seattle or California residents. And so um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's really difficult for residents that live here. And I see the, um, the, just the motivation to move to other counties um, close to their, um, you know, Lewis or Mason and telework or commute from, from those areas. So it's definitely something in our area that's really affecting our, our workforce here. Okay, Don. One more quick thing, just transit access, public transit access was an issue. I can say that I understand transit policies we just went through um, make clear we want to be more involved in the decisions about where growth occurs and, and we want to provide access, but we got to be part of that equation. And so hopefully that, that can be done. Thank you. Okay, well, obviously there's more work to be done than the other. We, we know, uh, you know, where the buildable lands are at. It's just a matter of, um, you know, planning for it and the, it's the affordability side that still just, just gets it, you know, um, so, um, you know, I guess more to come. Uh, let's go on to our next agenda item, which is the practical solutions for the state capital campus. Okay, hello again, this is Karen. And uh, this is great timing to be having this conversation about telework and the capital campus uh, right after the land use piece. Um, I live on the east side of Olympia near San Francisco Street Bakery. And I just met, my husband met our new neighbors. Uh, and they moved from California and they bought two houses in our neighborhood. Um, <laughs> one for them, one for their children and grandchildren. And so uh, there's some interesting things being developed out there. So um, you'll remember that we have talked to you before about our Capital Campus work. This came out of the conversation uh, about how do we deal with inner um, Interstate 5, and we know that we need to look at both the supply and the demand side. And so while we're looking at short and long and medium term decisions that need to be made and investments on I-5, we're also looking at are there ways that we can influence travel behavior to put off uh, the need to do um, some other bigger investments. And so thanks to the city of Olympia, um, who applied for a regional ability grant for us to look at this effort we have for the last year been uh, looking at the way people travel. And originally when we wrote the grant uh, application, it was all about fun, about state agencies challenging each other uh, to telework on Tuesdays. And, you know, uh, the Secretary of Transportation, who's very interested in increasing telework in his agency and across state government was all ready to, you know, throw down and challenge others. And then uh, COVID hit. And as I mentioned in the legislative piece, we went from five or 6% telework to 100% telework in some agencies. And so we knew that, um, our job was no longer about it being fun, that this wasn't a time to do fun challenges and the like, but rather to react to the reality of COVID, the reality of a huge increase in telework by looking at making sure we had as much data as we could gather during this time, talking to state agencies and others about what the challenges are that they were facing, uh, such as broadband access, such as, wait a minute, can people work from out of state? Um, you know, just lots of challenges that were happening. And so it's been a really good opportunity to, to really look at um, what will things look like in the future? 
And uh, another piece of the build of the lands piece that, that, that we were talking about, we're looking at um, what we've heard from some real estate folks is there's some interest in having bigger houses and ones with more doors because that open space was not working when you had the family with you 24 hours a day. Um, we talk about uh, outside buyers, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, we're also looking at uh, organizations really rethinking how much office space they need. So again, Department of Transportation uh, got out of a lease in Seattle and it's combined offices in downtown Seattle. Um, and that's a huge impact on uh, their bottom line and what it was costing for that second rental. And so there are many ways that COVID and uh, the way we work are influencing um, our buying habits. Is it possible after a year of COVID with people staying in their neighborhoods more um, and working from home, will those neighborhood centers work a little better? Would that pencil out better if you have more people that are in the community? So lots and lots of things to study. And I'm really excited. Um, to uh, have a speaker today. First, I'd like to recognize Veronica Jarvis with, um, from TRPC, who is our my cohort on this great project. And then I would like to introduce Kate Lister, who is the president of Global Workplace Analytics. Um, if you talk to anyone across the country and have questions about telework or what its impacts are in both the public and private sector, uh, Kate's name comes up. We talked about putting a panel together um, for one of our presentations with Kate and people that we contacted said, well, Kate has all the answers. Why, why would you ask other people to be there? So now I've just set her up to have all the answers on everything. So um, I would like to turn this over to Kate Lister. And I think that um, uh, Vina will be running her slides. And so let's move into that. And then I have some questions afterwards and I really encourage you to ask questions as well. Thank you. Kate. Wow. <laughs> Thanks for that introduction. <laughs> uh, I've been listening to a, a little bit of your conversation here for the last 15 minutes and it's just such an important dialogue and there are so many issues around this and there's no one right answer. Um, you can go to the next slide, Veronica. Uh, you know, I'm sure you have my bio somewhere, but I, I think it's important to know that while I've been pushing this remote work walk uphill for over 17 years, and now it kind of feels like it's chasing me and everybody else down the other side. Um, <laughs> I'm an advocate, not because, you know, I particularly like remote work, but because of the research that I've done that has shown me the people, planet, profit, and societal benefits that it offers. Um, I'm a former banker. <laughs> I, I, I tend to uh, come at things from a very uh, bottom line perspective uh, and from a kind of a prove it perspective. So I like to do things based on facts and based on science. But having said that, I, I recognize and I, I fully acknowledge that every organization needs to do what's right for them. Uh, every team within an organization uh, and every individual. And uh, that's going to be different from one, one organization, one state, you know, one whatever. We're all unique. We can't all be Google, not that we all want to. Uh, I've written five books, uh, all published by John Wiley and Sons and contributed to a number of others. The most recent, uh, curiously, started about three years ago from uh, a report I did for the International Labor Organization on the impact of telework on work-life balance. And that was turned into a book uh, published by a peer-reviewed uh, publisher, Edward Elgar. And it came out in, of all times, uh, December of 2019. So <laughs> it was rather timely. I wrote the US chapter. It was a six country study of, of remote work. And you can guess from the um, International Labor Organization, it, it was really about how is technology uh, hurting our lives uh, and how is it improving them? Next slide. I've worked with some of the largest uh, 
many large employers and some of the largest architectural firms, uh, design firms, uh, corporate real estate firms, who often bring me into their projects as the, uh, the, the guru on remote work. Next slide. And, and in terms of you know, why, I, uh, why I'm brought into those, I, I've, I've spent the last 17 years, as I said, collecting everything I can find, everything I put my eyeballs on that has to do with workplace research and what's good for people, planet and profit. And cataloged it in a, a library. I've got 6,000 notes that are fully tagged so that I can uh, do a search on, for example, telework and productivity and come up with thousands of hits. And then if I do the combination of the two, come up with 900 hits. So that when I'm talking to a C-suite, I can really talk with authority that this is why we think telework is going to improve your productivity. And here's the 25 case studies to prove it. So with that, uh, let me talk about some of those facts. Next slide. The uh, US uh, government does a federal employee viewpoint survey every year. And fortunately, the last one uh, was uh, uh, fielded in September through November uh, of, of last year. And so it captured a lot of what was going on in government. They also do another report called the state of, or the uh, annual report to Congress of telework. Unfortunately, the last one that they did was fielded just before the pandemic. And so we won't know for some time how, how that one pans out. But the viewpoint survey includes a lot of uh, telework questions. And what they learned during the pandemic was that uh, almost 60% of employees, uh, federal employees worked at home uh, pretty much full time. And that's compared to 3% before the pandemic. Next slide. They also found that uh, you know, engagement, which had been held steady and, and really going nowhere for the last several, year, several years jumped substantially and all of the contributors to uh, in, in engagement, you know, both from a leadership point of view, from a supervisor and from the, uh, the workers experience. So all of those things went up during the pandemic. Next slide. Same thing, they asked a number and they probably asked about 30 questions on workplace experience. You can download the report for yourself and look at it. But again, every factor, if you just look at the, the, the trend in all of these went up. My workload is reasonable. Uh, I know what's expected of me in the job. I feel encouraged. So you know, I think most employers uh, and, and even myself was fairly surprised at how quickly the uh, employee population and organizations were able to pivot on this. I mean, transitioning to a substantially remote work experience or you know, a hybrid experience is something that we would have spent six months to a year or even longer working with a large organization to, to, to try to make that an orderly transition and boom, they, they did it overnight. Next slide. Uh, we did a survey uh, together with a, uh, firm that we work with often called Iometrics, uh, that we were pretty much one of the first ones out of the gate uh, after the pandemic started with a, a really robust survey sample. We had uh, over 20,000 or 2,000 uh, respondents, um, not just in government, but I'm showing you the government slice here, um, and ask questions like, how successful do you feel working from home? Now, this was fielded in March and April. So this was, you know, this was very early on. And 73% were saying we feel very successful. I think the number, the, the number in the private sector was almost exactly the same. Another 20% said that they felt moderately successful. And so, if you think about all the things that were going on at that, you know, at that time, the cacophony of dealing with their children at home and their spouses at home, and technology and bandwidth and worry about COVID and all of that, it it, it really came as a surprise to us just how successful they had been at making the transition. Next slide. And, you know, okay, employees can say they're, they're doing well at home, but what do the managers say? Managers, almost identical. And I could show you probably 10 different uh, surveys that have been fielded since that time. Price Waterhouse, uh, McKinsey, Gartner, you know, you name it. These numbers have just held really steady throughout the pandemic. 
about 70%, you know, say that they're feeling very successful, not just but moderately successful, very successful. Next slide. In terms of what uh, is and isn't working, I mean, not everything is working equally. Averages can be very misleading. Uh, people, uh, ma managers in particular, are very happy with productivity and performance, say that's doing great, but they're not feeling so good about team dynamics, uh, their ability to manage. I mean, you know, a lot of managers we're still managing by seeing the backs of people's heads or you know, counting the number of butts in seats. And that doesn't really work in a virtual environment. Um, and it's one of the things that we would have trained them for had we done this in some orderly fashion. But interestingly, only about uh, only 8% said there was any large negative impact on any aspect. Well, we asked them about 12 different aspects of their management activities, only about 8% said that there was a large negative impact. The good news here is that these are the kinds of things that A, can be fixed with training, and B, are, are sort of point to the beauty of the hybrid mode. You know, we can do our focus work at home, we can be productive at home, and we can do our collaboration, and we can, you know, bring on new team members and that kind of thing in, uh, when we're in the office. Next slide. Uh, in terms of how, how productive they felt, uh, government employees said 82% uh, said they were very productive working from home, just slightly than the U.S. population, and only 14% disagreed. 10% in government said that they, they didn't feel successful at home. And, and you know, there's, there's very real, I don't, I don't think I have demographics in here, but we, we found very clearly that uh, the younger population is struggling most. And that was kind of a, a surprise to us because you, know, you think the younger population, they know how to use technology. You know, they've been, been doing virtual since they were born. Uh, but it turns out that they don't have the home space uh, that somebody older might have. They don't have the confidence in their role in the organization. Uh, they, they maybe need that subtle grooming that takes place, you know, being in the elevator and in the hallways and, and around people that have been doing this for a very long time. I had one uh, New York Times reporter that told me um, she learned how to interview when she was sitting in the bullpen. Uh, and so those, those issues are very, very real. There are all virtual companies that have figured out how to, um, how to do these things in, in the uh, virtual world. Uh, and we can learn a lot from them, but you know, it explains why a lot of, a lot of organizations are struggling in, in some areas. Next slide. We asked, uh, also asked uh, in terms of working alone and working with others, where are you more successful? Uh, in working alone, uh, they, about, uh, there was a 15% difference, uh, people saying that they were more successful at home. And in working with others, there was a 6% difference also uh, saying that they were more productive working from home. Now, interestingly, the, we had satisfaction questions that asked the same thing. So, and they were less satisfied with the, the time uh, that they were working with others at home. So, you know, we can get the job done. We can, we can make the decisions, we can have the collaborations, we can innovate, we can be creative, but we don't like it as much. Um, so, you know, we're human. Again, the hybrid mode. Next slide. We also asked, uh, you know, what, what do you, how do you account for the productivity? How many, how many, uh, and this was early and early on enough that they could remember being in the office. I'm not sure they could answer this question now, but um, how much are you interrupted at home versus the office? And uh, they said interrupted 32 minutes a day at home and 82 minutes in the office. These are the government numbers. So a 50 minute difference in the private sector, the difference was 35 minutes. Remember, this is under less than ideal conditions in the, uh, the home situation. And the problem is not just the interru uh, interruptions itself. A study by Microsoft showed that, you know, actually people are interrupted, mostly interrupting ourselves about uh, every three minutes. And once we're distracted, even for as little as 60 seconds, it can take 15 to 25 minutes to recover. So, you know, that feeling you have the, at the end of the day, like you've worked really hard and you've gotten nothing done. <laughs> this is why. It, it, it's not just a hit to productivity, but it's also a hit to uh, stress, frustration, and even physical health problems. Next slide. 
So I said, I'm a former banker and I do like to quantify things. So one of the things I, I like to point out is you take that 50 minute difference times the dollar per minute that a, uh, in this case, federal worker uh, is, that's what their annual salary works out to. And uh, so that's $50 a day times 125 work days a year, figuring half time remote work. So we're talking about $6,300 per person per year is what that 50 minute loss adds up to. And for an organization with a thousand employees, you do the math, uh, $6.3 million a year difference. I mean, this is huge. Uh, we also found um, and have found over the years and, and over the years that um, the other contributor, big contributor to uh, productivity at home is people tend to give back about half of the time they would have otherwise spent commuting. So that's another 30 to 35 minutes a day. These aren't numbers that are unique to the pandemic. These are numbers that we have tracked over the years and, and have been absolutely solid. Next slide. One of the things that organizations uh, have looked to in promoting remote work is the ability to do, reduce their real estate costs. Although I have to say that in this, in this, in this pandemic time, the emphasis has been much more on the people side, uh, how, it will, how it improves uh, human productivity, human performance, uh, reduces work-life conflict, although it also introduces some, um, and, and much more of the people factors than, hey, you know, we just, we see this as a strategy for saving money. But, you know, if you don't have people coming to the office every day, then you do have the potential to reduce your office space. Uh, but oftentimes people want to work remotely, but they still want their office space. They still, they still want that desk. <laughs> they still want that assigned desk. Um, and so we asked in that survey uh, back in uh, March, April, would you be willing to give up your desk? And these numbers are much higher than we would have seen before the pandemic. People were really, really stuck on those desks. 67% uh, said that they would be willing to give up their desk in exchange for being able to work remotely. Um, and so, you know, I think this is an indication, although we have all kinds of indications uh, that people want to do this, uh, just how much they want to, just how important it is for them to have flexibility. About 80% of the, the workforce said they wanted to work remotely at least some of the time before the pandemic, the, uh, the numbers were a little bit higher in government. Um, and by some of the time, I mean, at least one day a week. Uh, and that has really not changed. Uh, what has changed is how frequently they want to do it. Uh, they in fact want to do it more frequently than they did before the pandemic. Turns out to be about two and a half days a week is the average. Next slide. Oh, I already talked about this. Um, so in government, the number is, uh, is 85%. Uh, and only 6% uh, say they don't want to work remotely at all. The numbers we're seeing in the, in the general population is about 10% um, want to be in the office, 5 to 10% want to be in the office all the time. Uh, about uh, 15 to 25% want to be uh, all remote. And then the, middle, the rest want hybrid. Managers would like to see them in the office in th the three to four day a week range. Employees would like to be at home in the three to four day a week range and where they're settling is, is in that middle. Next slide. Uh, when we asked, uh, the, when you asked uh, in the last engagement survey, 43,000 responses, uh, how often people wanted to work remotely. Uh, you can see the distribution here. If you look, you know, at the big ones, the, the blue, the orange, uh, and the gray, that's more than once a week with the blue being uh, full time. So higher than the numbers I was saying in, in, in the general population. And again, only 6% uh, say they never want to, and only 17% say that, uh, you know, their, their position just doesn't allow it. I think one of the things that we all learned during this is that uh, people, a lot more people can be successful working remotely than we thought. It was kind of the 7% privilege before the pandemic. Uh, and the 7% included the older, more senior, uh, uh, higher ranking executives that got to do it. Next slide. 
in another survey that we did with a company called Owl, Owl Labs, and this was in September of last year, we had 2,500 respondents. We said, you know, okay, what if your employer said uh, you, you can't work remotely? Well, 66% said they would stay and be less happy. 54% uh, said that they would be, uh, they'd stay, but be less willing to go the extra mile. Like, these are really the kind of employees you want to have around, right? <laughs> Uh, and about 46% said they would look for another job. Um, a, a fairly large percent also said they would expect a pay increase if they were asked to come back into the office. Next slide. Uh, Gartner did a survey in December of last year and found that 90% of HR leaders uh, said that they would allow employees to re work remotely. So that's a huge change over what we've seen in the past. Next slide. Um, and you know, in terms of quantifying the benefits, I had the honor of testifying before Congress last July on the expansion of telework and government. And based on a calculator that we developed um, that I'll, I'll show you an image in a minute, uh, I testified that the government could save $14 billion a year if those that were already documented, already deemed eligible to work from home work, did so uh, half time or more. Uh, that testimony is available both in video and, and written. I'll, there's a link at the end here for you. Next slide. In terms of that calculator, uh, this is something that we put on our website 12 years ago and have made free to anybody that wants to use it to calculate the people, planet, and profit uh, impact of remote work. It's got 125 variables and 600 calculations. And in 2016, the U.S. General Accountability Office uh, came to us and asked for a peek behind the curtain because they were replying to a congressional question about um, how come we're not uh, how come we're not doing more reporting of the financial impact of remote work, and so they were charged with going out and looking at tools. So they they looked at ours and reported to Congress that it was comprehensive and based on solid research, and it was the only tool that they recommended in their report to Congress. Next slide. I tell you all that because you know these are really big numbers, and I need you to know that uh, you know that they were based on on facts that that at least got through the General Accountability Office. So you know, pretty conservative um, numbers here: increase of fifteen percent in productivity. We estimate uh, for half time remote work, and just during the time that we're they're working remotely. 25% reduction in real estate, so half of the time, you know, if they're doing it 50% of the time, you wouldn't, you don't get a 50% decrease, you get a 25% decrease. Uh, absenteeism, I have research showing companies that have reduced their absenteeism by 80% as a result of telework. Uh, we assume 30% here. Retention, I have uh, call center industry uh, numbers that show, you know, they've reduced their retention hugely as a result of this. And then in terms of continuity of operations, you know, I, I, I assume employees can work because if, if, if employees were able to get to work one day a year that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to, this would be the savings. That was the number I've had in this, this calculator for 12 years. You know, never did I think of putting in 365 or you know, however many days it has been since then. And then of course there are costs involved. So I take those off. And it comes up to about $11,000 per half-time remote worker per year um, and uh, or $11 million a year for every thousand half-time remote workers. These are based on uh, average salaries in the uh, private sector, by the way. Next slide. So, you know, in the not very long run now, really, uh, if it's not good for employers, employees, environment and society, uh, it's not good for anybody. And I think we're just being under, uh, being uh, forced to understand that uh, employees are voting with their feet. Uh, they wanna work for companies that have a purpose uh, that, that are doing the right thing for society. Uh, customers are voting with their feet and investors are voting with their wallets. And it, you know, there is just no, uh, no better way in my mind to uh, tick all of these boxes. Next slide. It's, you know, I'm not saying there aren't challenges. There are a lot of challenges, uh, particularly because we haven't gone through the orderly transition to this hybrid approach or this remote work approach. So, 
you know, these are some of the things that we're working with uh, with companies right now uh, to try to, to deal with the, the question of equity, um, who can, who can't, how do you treat the people that are in the office the same that people uh, are not in the office. Uh, companies are feeling this cultural disconnect uh, with, with not having people in the office and, and a sense of uh, loss in team dynamics. They're having trouble bringing on new employees uh, and you know, bringing them into the, uh, the culture. And as I mentioned, uh, younger workers and parents uh, are, are having the most difficulty and overworking is huge. I mean, the, the stress level in organizations is, is just over the top. Uh, and as a result, well-being is, is uh, for, for the first time in history, Gallup reported that uh, employee engagement is up and well-being is down. I mean, they just can't quite do that. Uh, they they went in opposite directions, and they always thought that those things were um, uh, that were paired. You, you know, you had to have one to have the other. So you know, they're going through this analysis of, geez, what changed? Um, and then there's you know just all the stress of of everything else that's going on. So you know, some of these things will be fixed when we get back to being into the office part of the time. But this is not just, this, this is a strategic change. This is not a, a tactical one. And we need, really need to address it at the top level of the organization. And if there's a, a, a silver lining to the pandemic, I think it's that has lost, lofted this conversation of where, when, and how people work to the, uh, to the, to the corporate leaders, uh, to the organizational leaders, to the, the heads of government. So, Karen, I, I believe that you've got some questions and then I would love to take any questions from the audience. I think concerning the time we're at, I think I will ask the audience first, um, our membership, you, if they have questions. Can you stop sharing your screen, please? Great, thank you. Uh, Doug? Yeah, I got, got some concerns. Your survey is that devoted entirely to the employee side of the car whereas I'm interested as a customer in the customer side. And I had found two major concerns. Number one is the quality of the work. Uh, I dealt with one organization three or four times on the telephone, no success. Finally, we waited in line for an hour to get into the office and got the answer in 15 minutes. So the quality bothered me. The second thing that bothers me more is security. Uh, a lot of those people that are on telephone telephones I think are on their own home phones, but I'm concerned about A, uh, the, the security of their own home phone lines, and B, the fact that you may be giving them some confidential information, which now gets lost in all the papers floating around the house uh, and really should be confined to the employer's location itself. So those are two concerns, and I don't know that other people have those, but I certainly do. Uh, I guess the yeah. cybersecurity is a big one. What's that? The I'm cybersecurity sorry. has to be a big one. Are, are, are we really right. safe in, in, in that circumstance? Well, I mean, were we really safe at the office is another question. Uh, I, I think this is one of those things that this has pushed to the forefront. I mean, we had people working remotely uh, before, while only 3% did full-time. You know, you know from every coffee shop you've been to that people have been working uh, remotely for a long time. And so I think, this has pushed us to the rigor of figuring those things out. Uh, I've done some work with the federal government and uh, talked to a, a, a guy in the Department of Defense that said, hey, you know, if, if we can do it, anybody can do it. Uh, now, granted, they have more, more money to make it safe than anybody else, um, but the ability to make it safe is there. The human factor is the one that we have to uh, deal with. So federal government is required to use soft phones. They're not allowed to use their home phones. Uh, in many organizations, they're, they're only allowed to use the company phones or they're required to use soft phones. And, but if they can't get a connection, because I know I've been on these calls with them, they pick up their own cell phone. You know, that's a procedural issue. And it's, it's one that we need to address whether we're, uh, whether we're remote or not. Um, in terms of the customer service, you know, I can tell you that the statistics that the government, the, that federal uh, survey that they did also asked about customer satisfaction and uh, ability to, to deliver on mission. 
And both of those went down very slightly, uh, about 5% or 6% uh, of, of how, the, they, how they did with customers. Uh, in, in the private sector, I know this is something that they pay a lot of attention to. I've got a, a large manufacturing uh, company as a, as a client, uh, and they're uh, very much tracking customer satisfaction, net promoter score, uh, and actually found that it has gone, gone up. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of um, implementation. There's good implementation and bad implementation. And uh, I think it's just uh, drawn our attention to it more. So I have a question. Do you find um, when people are working from home, um, does the employer uh, pay a portion of their um, internet costs or, or how does that work when, when, a, when an employee is now working from home? You know, that it, it does add some additional costs to, yeah. uh, you know, making sure that you have proper broadband, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we estimate a typical employee can save between $2,500 and $5,000 a year as a result of not driving, dry cleaning, $4 lattes, um, uh, you know, all the serendipity purchases going out to lunch. But, you know, those kinds of things aren't, like, aren't really pocket change for them. You know, you don't really see, you don't really feel that you haven't spent that money in the depreciation on your car or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, those are very real concerns, particularly if people at the low end of the wage spectrum. Uh, some states actually require that California requires that uh, companies reimburse any expenses that an employee has uh, for performing their work, regardless of where they perform it. It hasn't really ever been tested in the courts what they exactly mean. It's just being started to now. What we're finding uh, across the board is that organizations, about 20, about 80% of organizations have provisioned their people for technology. Um, about 20% of, of organizations have somehow provisioned for office furniture, you know, ergonomic chair, ergonomic desk, or allowed them to take stuff home from the, uh, from the office. Um, and I don't have an exact percentage. In fact, we, we did, we did uh, poll it in one of the surveys, but I, I don't remember the numbers. Uh, of companies that are reimbursing for utilities, mortgage, um, uh, you know, both heating utilities and, uh, and internet, uh, you know, paper usage at home uh, on an expense basis. So, you know, you, uh, you, you, you expense those things. Stipends are a little bit difficult because they become taxable income. Uh, what, what, about so, the economic, you know, what about the economic impact of the, now, you know, for example, what if the capital campus all went to telework? And so that means those employees are now not going to downtown Olympia for their lunch and to maybe shop after work and so on and so forth. Have, have you looked it's at huge that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's huge and it's tragic. Um, one of the, the difficulties companies are having now in bringing people back is that nothing's open. Uh, you know, their cafeterias aren't going to be open because of social distancing. The small businesses have already, you know, have already gone out of business um, or are on different schedules. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it's, it's absolutely tragic. You, you can say that on average, you know, okay, the, the commerce is going to go now to the regions. The, the, there's going to be winners and losers in this, but we don't live in the world of averages. Those people that suffered in the city are not the same ones that are going to set up in in the suburbs. Um, my own utopian uh, point of view is that if we improve the, the getting downtown and the conditions of downtown, uh, they may return to being places of um, entertainment and culture. And I used to go down to San Diego, you know, often. Uh, and I'm only about 20 minutes north as the crow flies, but I'm not a crow. <laughs> and uh, it's just ridiculous to get down there. I would go down again if it was easier to get there. Mm -hmm. And the, my, one last point, and then we'll, I'll go to Danny. The, the other thing that we're seeing from this pandemic and so many people telecommuting is how hard it, it is for the retail to get employees now for restaurants and, and small retailers because so many people can work from home that they're, they're choosing to do that. And so it's really hard to get I mean, it is very difficult for me for, I mean, I have a, a private business, small business. It's, I've never had this hard of a time trying to find employees. And I hear it 
with other retailers and um, on restaurants as well. It's just, it's so difficult on the retail side to find employees because people can easily work from home um, and they're choosing to do that, uh, understandably, <laughs> but it is, uh, you know, caused a real um, shortage of, of workers, uh, you know, on, on the retail side. Yeah, and I think that's confounded by the unemployment. I mean, what I'm hearing from a lot of employers is that, hey, I can collect unemployment and get, you know, just about the same thing I would get going to work. Why don't I just sit here? Um, you know, I, I think that's a, a little bit um, over my pay grade, uh, but it's a societal problem that we, we need to deal with. Um, and, you know, I don't know whether that comes from automation, um, you know, in, the, in California, the minimum wage has gone to $15 an hour. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that's good either. Uh, that, that's, I'm, I've owned several small businesses myself. I know how painful that is. Um, but, you know, I think we've been going to that for quite some time. I know that in Canada, they, they've been suffering from this for, you know, last five years. They're paying fast food people $25 an hour. Uh, Danny, do you have something? Yeah, and I know we're short on time, but I just wanted to give some quick feedback that the, um, the term subtle grooming is not always a welcome one, especially from young women in the workplace. So you might want to consider reframing that to hallway conversations. Um, but also, okay. um, I, I, I mean, that made me think that, you know, teleworking creates a level of protection from people who do experience harassment in the workplace, uh, something to also consider. And also in terms of those hallway conversations, I think um, there's a lot of opportunity for bias to creep in uh, when those are happening and moving to more of a teleworking environment might make those uh, the opportunities that are created through those more performance driven, um, especially if that's the intention of the workplace to, to make improvements in that area. So those are just some of the thoughts that uh, came up for me while you were speaking. So thank you for your presentation. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, leveling the playing field is, is uh, significant, particularly in terms of meetings. Uh, the introverts have found it easier to, to get their voices heard uh, in the meetings, for example. Uh, but it takes some intentionality. It takes, uh, you know, uh, leaders have to, to understand how to run those meetings and how to be inclusive. Well, we are over on time. Does anyone have anything else? Um, Thank you. And, go, Andy, go ahead, I would like to, um, I would just like to say that we will be finishing our capital campus report soon and we'll be bringing that back to you. And there are so many layers uh, to these issues. And um, I would just say that as we're looking, I, th I think probably one of the most profound things we've all found is that, um, and Kate says it better than I, but um, the pandemic and the working from home have revealed problems. They have created a few, but mostly they have revealed them. So did we already know that there was uh, discrimination on, on many levels in who could telework? Yes, but we may or may not have had the data. So Bureau of Labor Statistics says that um, about 30% of people can work from home. 37% of Asian workers are allowed to work from home. 29% white, 19% black, 16% Hispanic and Latina. Is that just because of prejudice in the workplace or is it the greater systemic kinds of problems that say that all jobs are not equally available to everyone? And so this revealing of um, mm -hmm. problems that we have in our system is one that I think we're all learning a lot and um, I look forward to continuing to work on this issue. Um, and just so you know, we will be starting phase two of the Capital Campus Project in July. So we'll be finishing the work with the City of Olympia and this grant, and then we will be starting uh, another study. So we're gonna continue to look at this and what the impacts are. And I really appreciate Kate being involved. She'll be doing a bottom line on telework as part of this project. So basically for local and state government, um, what would we save um, in many ways um, by having more teleworking? And that includes traffic fatalities and the like. The last thing I would say is that we will be bringing back to you in the future 
the Olympic region of DOT has just will be moving into their new facility soon. And they have the office of the future. Uh, they have built it to be hoteling space and the like. We have some great pictures, but um, that's something we'll be bringing to you as well. Thank you. Uh, Doug, do you have a real quick report? I'll be going to Seattle tomorrow virtually. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, then we have uh, reached our agenda. Uh, Karen and Mark, can you stay on? But for everyone else, I'm going to call this meeting adjourned. Non-debatable motion. Thank you. Thanks.